What is the future direction of mortgage rates? How do you qualify for more mortgage loans at the best terms with the lowest interest rates? And Americans have near record equity levels in their properties. So what's the best way to access that equity yet keep your low rate mortgage in place? We're answering all of that today with the company president that's created more financial freedom through real estate than any other lender in the entire nation. That is the top tier and eponymous Ridge Lending Group. It's time for a big welcome back to Chaley Ridge. Keith, you flatter me. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, sir. Good to see you. Well, you help us here because debt and loan are our favorite four letter words around here at GRE and you help <laughs> us efficiently optimize them both, Chaley. And interest rates have just been on so many people's minds shortly after they had their all time low in January of 2021. And they since rose and then have settled down. You know, Chaley, I have been trying to think through myself why people seem to put this over emphasis on the interest rate. Now, it's surely important. It is your cost of money. But the way I thought that people overemphasize the rate is because maybe people love to discuss the direction of interest rates even more so than real estate prices and rents is because prices and rents nearly always go up and interest rates can go up and down. So therefore it's maybe more interesting for people to talk about. You know, I also think about how rates sort of tap into that human fear of loss, you know, by paying interest, trumping the triumph of gain through cash flow or appreciation. And then maybe as well, it's because higher mortgage rates, they mean higher rates of, of all types, which permeate into all of one's life's debt. So, you know, these are my thoughts about why people maybe put an over emphasis on mortgage interest rates. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm sure there's probably something to that. And you're right, Keith, interest rates are, are always the, the, the hot topic. Everybody wants to talk about interest rates. I think that overall, though, it is a lack of education and there's a psychology to it. Um, you and I have talked about interest rates at nauseum over the years. And I do understand, but I think you and I agree because we live in this space and we're constantly looking at the math, they are probably third or fourth on the list of priorities when you're deciding right. on if this investment is valid for fitting into my my goal box. But you know, I think it's more about getting the information out there and informing the masses about interest rates and doing that math to make sure that they're not just pigeonholing themselves into keeping a 3% interest rate or not expanding their portfolio because they're afraid of giving up what they have and not really realizing the power of the equity, the tax deduction, the rent increases, all of those variables are often ignored when people start talking about interest rates until you start to have that reasonable and rational conversation that helps them identify what the math is. Because the math won't lie, right? The math will not lie. Yeah, that's right. Things more important than interest rate with an investment property might be the price you're paying for that property or right. the level of rent that's there, or even maybe knowing you already have a good property manager that you trust in that market where that property is. But of course, rates matter somewhat. Now we're going to get a future looking prediction from you later, but your last mortgage rate prediction, Chaley, you may not remember the details of it. It was made here on the show in November of 2022. <laughs> that's when rates were 7%. Back at that time, you said that rates should keep climbing, but at a slower pace. And that happened. And you predicted the peak by spring of 2023 of 7.625%. What happened is in October of 2023, they hit 7.8% per Freddie Mac. So you almost completely nailed it because most everyone believes that that was the peak for this cycle. And if so, you were within a few months and just two tenths of 1% of identifying the peak. Thank you, Keith. Um, I appreciate that acknowledgement. You know, I, I get it right a lot, but I, you know, I am, I have been, um, my crystal ball has been broken uh, several times over, especially the last couple of years. So I'll want to acknowledge that too. I pay attention to the Fed. And as a good friend of mine is always saying, don't fight the Fed. If you are listening to what they're saying, actually listening to the words that are coming out of their mouths, it's not too terribly hard to kind of predict where we're going to be in certain um, milestones of any given year. So I do have a good prediction for, for this year. We'll share later. But yeah, as you said, rates are not completely irrelevant. I just want to uh, impress upon your listeners that they really should be looking at, at the investment holistically and not just 
laser focused on that interest rate. There's more to it. That was excellent. You have more audacity than me when it comes to predicting interest rates. It's a business I typically stay out of. So I'm going to outsource that to you later. I'll predict things like real estate prices, but I think rates are notoriously difficult. And with what's happened with rates, now that they have come off their peak substantially from back in October of 2023, what's happened with the refinance business? Is that something that's picked up again there? Yeah, we're starting to see a bit more. I would say that last year, refi numbers were down, right, for obvious reasons, but we are seeing some more business in the refinance department. I think depending on the individual and uh, largely the strategy of the investment, the long-term versus the mid-term versus the short-term, we're seeing a little bit more um, on the refi side for the short-term rentals than we are on the long-term. But overall, uh, yes, I would agree that they're starting to pick up. I may mention too, Keith, it might be useful for the listeners, so while I agree, we've seen that interest rates started on their descent, uh, which was great news. Everybody was excited to see that. We're still finding that the points that are being uh, secured or paid on, especially investment property loans, are still on the high end of the spectrum. And for those that aren't aware of the why behind that how, it might be important just to mention that when we talk about mortgage-backed securities, the overall servicing of these mortgage-backed securities that are bought and sold and traded on, on the secondary markets, they're pretty smart in forecasting when rates are high, what happens to those mortgages when they come back down, they start to refinance, right? They start to pay off. And the servicing rights of these loans take two to three years before they're even profitable. So the servicers and the secondary markets know that they have to charge those extra points to hedge their losses because when the, the loans that they're paying for and servicing today are gonna pay off in six months or 12 months, they're going to be at a loss if it takes them 24 to 36 months to be profitable. That's why um, investors are seeing, especially investors are seeing extra points being charged on the loans that they're securing today. Oh, that's a great explanation. And really, this is because there's no prepayment penalty associated with residential mortgage loans in the United States, typically. So therefore, the person that's on the, the back end of these loans, the investor there needs to be sure that they're, they're compensated somehow when one goes ahead and maybe refinances out of their loan at a presumably lower interest rate, maybe in as little as 12 months or so. Yes, sir. Exactly right. Yeah. And prepayment penalties on conventional never will there are no prepayment penalties on conventional just to clarify on a non-qm product which of course we have too you know debt service coverage ratio products etc on non-owner occupied those typically will have prepayment penalties but the fanny freddy stuff the gse stuff no prepay ever well now that rates have come down presumably off their peak in this cycle you know i think a lot of people wonder about all right now what's a prudent way for me to harvest my equity since we have near record equity levels in property and yet keep my low rate mortgage in place i think a lot of people don't even understand that you can do that and take a second mortgage to access some of that dead equity. What are your thoughts? I love it. I love a HELOC in general. Um, we do now have one of our newer product lines is a second lien HELOC. We have two options there. Both of them cap at 70% CLTV. That's combined loan to value. So all you need to do to figure out what you're gonna have access to is take the value that you think the property would appraise for times 70% from that number, subtract the first lien balance, and that will give you what your uh, line on a HELOC, second lien position HELOC would be. And I love it. All right, so therefore, if one has 50% equity in a property, they could access 20% more up to that 70% CLTV, the combined loan to value ratio between your first mortgage and your second mortgage, which might take the form of a HELOC, a home equity line of credit. Perfectly said. We also have second lien HE loans worth mention. Um, a HE loan is really exactly the same thing as your first lien mortgage. It's a fixed rate second. It's just in second lien position, 30 year fixed. Those go to 85% CLTV. So you get quite a bit more leverage, but the rates are gonna be on the, you know, 12, 13% range. Oh, that's interesting. Tell us about some more of the trade-offs between the HELOC, where we typically have a fixed rate period and a floating period afterwards, and the HE loan. Just some more of those trade-offs as we devise our strategy. Yeah, the HE lock is variable, right? The interest rate can change, as you said. The reason I prefer the HE lock, if the numbers made sense, is that you're only paying interest on monies that you're using at that point in time. So if you had a $100,000 HE lock and you were only using 20,000 of it for whatever investment purposes or whatever, then you're paying interest just on the 20. The HE loan is exactly as you would expect. 
You're getting all of that money at once and you will be paying interest on all of it, whether or not you're using it. There's less flexibility on a HE loan. While it does provide extra leverage, I do generally prefer the HE lock. Now, now sometimes a question I've asked myself in the past, Chaley, when I was new as an investor is sort of, why wouldn't I take a second mortgage HE lock or HE loan? Because I don't necessarily have to draw against it, but it might be good for me to have it as an option just to be sure that it's there. Absolutely, um, especially the HELOC, because like I said, yeah. you will not pay interest on, on anything you're not using. And to have it when the time comes, right? If you want to um, be prepared, which I think is huge, we both agree there. The one thing I would mention about that though is oftentimes on the HELOCs, there will be a minimum draw at closing. You can put it right back after closing, but chances are there's going to be a 50,000 or 100,000 minimum draw, depending on what the line limit is. Maybe 75% of the entire limit is what the minimum draw would be. But again, you can put it right back after closing. So maybe you pay 30 days of interest on that before you're able to, to stick it back in the HELOC. Otherwise, I just I think it's it's one of my favorite strategies for investors and having access to those funds when the time comes. Oh, well, that's an interesting piece there. So you as an investor, as you're devising your strategy, as you're looking at the equity position in your own home, as well as your rental properties, you know, maybe you're looking at a low rate of, say you have a 4% mortgage loan, but you've had a, a bloated equity position and you go ahead and you take out a second mortgage in any of the forms that Chaley's talking about. And that second mortgage has say a 10% a interest rate. Well, you don't simply take the 4% on your first loan and your 10% on the second and average it and say, well, now I'm paying 7%. Of course, you have to weight those averages. It's pretty likely that you have a higher mortgage balance on your first loan than your second loan. So depending on their balances, therefore, if your first mortgage has a 4% interest rate and your second mortgage has a 10% interest rate, your blended rate might be something like five and a half. Right, exactly right. And there's all kinds of um, tools and calculators online. If somebody wanted to check that out, uh, you can find them very easily, just the weighted average of mortgage rates, and you can plug in your numbers. It'll tell you exactly what, if you're using this amount or this amount or whatever it is, what your weighted average would be. Yeah, definitely important for you as an investor, checking your arbitrage and your cash flow, certainly. Well, Chaley, I wonder now that we are in an environment finally where rates have actually fallen for more than a year now, how is the appetite for arms adjustable rate mortgages looked in there? Um, we're still on what's called an inverted yield from the 0809 housing and lending kind of debacle. We found ourselves in a place where adjustable rate mortgage or arms actually priced an interest rate higher than a 30 year fixed, creating that inverted yield. We have yet to see the uh, correction of that. So we're still kind of in that place where depending on the characteristics of the transaction, the arm might be a higher interest rate. Maybe it's about the same as the 30 year fixed. If there is a, a scenario where the arm is lower, it might be an eighth or a quarter of a percentage point. So it's unlikely that we would recommend an arm over a fixed. There'd be have to have to be some very um, specific circumstances if it's only a quarter point improvement to rate for a five year arm versus a 30 year fixed. Well Chaley, you deal with so many investors in there, both newer investors and veteran real estate investors. So when we talk first about the new investors, are there any just sort of common obstacles to overcome that you see in there for people that are looking to get their first investment property? You know, I think their why. A lot of times we'll have investors come to us and really not even understand more than they just don't want their money in the stock market anymore. And they want to find uh, another venue or another vehicle in which to create their investment um, uh, freedom, their, their financial free freedom through. So I would say for brand new investors, really start to ask that question, what is your why? What is it that you wanna get out of this? Do you want total replacement income of your ordinary income today? Do you love what you do for work and you just want supplemental income? How much does that income need to be? Does it need to be what you're making today? Can it be a little bit less? Does it need to be more based on what you expect your lifestyle to be? So lots of different questions to be asking yourself. So I would say that commonly, just really understanding at least a baseline. And then we can start connecting some dots together and planting seeds that I talk about. A baseline of, of what it is that you're hoping to accomplish through real estate. All right, so that's what you often see with the beginning investor. How about that repeat investor? Are there obstacles to overcome that are common in there on expanding one's portfolio? Maybe that's a, a debt to income ratio threshold that one reaches and you need to strategize with them there. Yeah, the debt to income ratio, ultimately, when you get there, is probably a good problem to have, right? 
um, when you're having to have conversations that way. I think that the obstacles to overcome is making sure that you have a good support team. And I think that would start with your lender, um, someone that has a multitude of loan products that aren't just one size fits all. I would say that we, we check that box very well. But strategizing, one of my favorite conversations with my clients is having those strategy one-on-one -on -one calls about their debt to income ratio and figuring out from a scheduling perspective, uh, how can we maximize their deductions? Because that's one of the beautiful things about real estate investing, right? Is right. that schedule E. So maximizing over there without it taking you over certain thresholds to continue to qualify. There can be a weighted scale there as well. And those are the, the uh, conversations that we have with our clients usually earlier in the year, but we're always looking at our clients' draft tax returns. That's important. Before you ring that bell, get us copies of your draft tax returns so that we can run the math and we'll even show them how the pluses and minuses work. It's, it's pretty interesting to most people. And then come up with a solution that says, okay, if you want to do this for 2024, here are our recommendations, X, Y, or Z. And then they can make the informed decision that, that fits what their goals are for the year. Yeah, these are the scenarios that a mortgage loan company that specializes in income property loans can help you with, with your future planning. How can you set yourself up considering your personal situation, your tax deductions, how much income do you want to show, and all those sorts of things to give you more runway to add income properties to your portfolio. And Chaley, you do see so many scenarios in there and so many investors. You know, sometimes when you're here, I like to ask you to get a temperature of the appraisal market. What percent of appraisals are you seeing come in high on and what percent are coming in low approximately? I would say that we're probably over 50% on the high, but not by any large margin. Um, I'll see 10,000, 15,000 regularly over what we had expected in huh. the actual value pretty commonly just right on the money, right on the mark. I think it's real market specific to be sure. I don't see the the short values come in all that that much. If it is generally, it's probably because the investor is brand new, didn't unfortunately talk to us in advance. They were doing the Burr method and they didn't get the right comps or have the right advice about what that ARV might end up being. Uh, so they got trapped in a situation where uh, they learned the hard way. Interesting. I don't know that I remember that from the past where more than 50% of appraisals have come in high. That pretends well for future valuations, at least here Agreed. in the near term. All right, Chaley. Well, we talked about your record with mortgage rate predictions here and how good that track record was. Why don't you let us know where you think mortgage rates are going to be by the end of 2024? I do think that the rates are going to be higher for longer. Don't fight the Fed, remember. Uh, listen to what they have to say. I would preface this by saying that all of the indicators for inflation, except for one of them, have been hot to the side that does not help us with interest rates. The employment uh, jobs report, uh, you've got the uh, the CPI, uh, all these different metrics have come in hot where they're higher than what we would want to see them for that inflationary measure where the feds have been extremely clear that they want to hit that 2% mark. Where that number came from, I don't know. That's another conversation. Uh, there's only been one metric that actually worked to the rate environment to get it lower, which is the PCE, the personal consumption expenditure for those that, that aren't familiar with that um, acronym. Anyway, I think they're going to be higher for longer. I, there's been a lot of um, headlines out there saying that uh, Mar I'm getting to a rate, I promise. I'm just going to, to preface this first. That March might be the first reduction in the Fed fund rate, which, by the way, remember, is not the same as a long-term 30-year fixed mortgage rate. Right. There are links to them, but they are different. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that if we're going to see uh, rates come down, the first Fed fund rate reduction probably sometime in June is where I may put my predictions. And then by the end of the year, the interest rate I'm going to put at 6.125 for 30 year fixed mortgages and non-owner occupied purchase with 25% down. That's my prediction. All right, you are on the record now. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's so interesting, at least with what the, the Fed does with rates, Chaley, it's like, you know, the, an entire world where good news is is bad news, right? If you've got great job growth and great GDP, oh, well, that's bad news because they're probably going to keep rates high since those things tend to keep inflation high. It's like, what, if you want the lowest mortgage rate ever, you want in the world to be unemployed except you, you know? It's just right. so funny how, how I'm good I'm glad you news. said that. Yeah, the worse the economy is, the better the rates are. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you offer so many products in there, mostly to investors, but you have other ones. And it's not just for buy and hold type of investors. It's for those that, that are doing birth strategies, like you mentioned, and other strategies. Why don't you tell us about all the loan types that you offer in there? 
Yeah, we do have quite a few. Thank you for asking. Um, so we start with the Fannie Freddies. We call these the golden tickets, everybody. Um, highest leverage, lowest interest rate. A lot of times the newer investors will start by exhausting those. There are 10 per qualified individual. If you're a married couple, you can have up to 20, as you and I have talked about in the past, Keith. Beyond that, we've got something called non-QM. QM stands for qualified mortgage. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the definition of what a qualified mortgage is. So everything outside of that box of underwriting is now non-QM. And non-QM uh, in and of itself is extremely diverse, not just for investors, for anybody. Um, but within that subset of, of product, you've got debt service coverage ratio, where there is no personal income documentation. It's all about the properties, rents, divided by the payment. We have bank statement loans in there. We've got asset depletion. So if you've got a million dollars in a, an exchange, a stock exchange account, there's a formula that we can use to, to utilize that as income. Uh, beyond that, we have short-term bridge loans for those that are fix and flipping or fix and holding, where you need cash for the purchase and the renovation or rehab. We have second lien HELOCs. Those are newer to our product line. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about those. We touched on that. We have commercial loans for commercial property, commercial loans for residential, if it were applicable. And then of course, uh, the all-in-one, which is a first lien HELOC, still my favorite, but we've spent lots of time talking about that. So that's that's probably a good uh, overview or at least abbreviated checklist of products we have. And I've got investor loans in there myself for new purchases. I've done investor loans in there myself for refinancings. I mean, you're who I go to for my own loans. And you're in nearly all 50 states, right? And these are the states where the property is, not where the investor resides. Yes, sir. Exactly right. We are in 48 states. We are not in New York or North Dakota. Otherwise, we're going to be um, funding everywhere that they're looking to purchase, refi, sell, etc. Yeah, well, let our audience know where they can learn more, because I know you offer a lot of good free tools, like something we didn't get a chance to talk about, a first lien HELOC all in one loan. Like, for example, you have a simulator there when an investor can just go ahead and run through that. So where can one find all of those resources? So check out our website. There's a lot of good information on there, lots of video content, free education. The simulator link will be on there if you wanted to check out the comparison between what you have now your 3% interest rate or your 2.5% interest rate compared to this all-in-one. I'll tell you guys that I run that scenario all the time and people are very surprised when they see that this adjustable rate first lien HELOC is beating the pants off of a 2.25% rate. So check that out. Um, our community is in the website. Uh, we meet every other Tuesday. It's called Live with Shaley. That's www.ridgelendinggroup.com. Email us, info at ridgelendinggroup.com. And then you can call us, of course, toll free at 855-747-4343. The easy way to remember is 855-74-RIDGE. Shaley Ridge, informative as always, and brazen with the mortgage rate predictions. You can learn more about how they can help you at ridgelendinggroup.com. It's been great having you back on the show, Shaley. Thank you, Keith. You can watch this one next.